So this is the video where Mr. Myron Golden goes beneath the greatest depths of deception to trick you out of your salvation and cause you to stumble and be a curse from Christ forever. As you watch this video, pay attention to the cracks in his message. And I kindly ask you to inbox Mr. Golden the list of scriptures and explanation that I provide at the end of this video. Because this man will and continues to deceive many. All glory to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He's the author and finisher of our faith. And without him, nothing is possible. So I'm going to play the video in segments. And I'm going to give my thoughts according to the holy word of God. Let's get right to it. Um, a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And a lot, I've heard preachers say that there's this gate in Jerusalem that's lower than the other gates. And in order for a camel to go through, uh, they had to take everything off its back and it had to get down on its knees to crawl through. And I thought, well, that sounds interesting. That's an interesting idea. But I went to Israel and while I was there in Jerusalem, <laughs> I, I asked our guide, is there a gate here in Jerusalem that's lower than the other gate? So when a camel comes through, they have to go through on their knees. And he said, I don't know anything about that gate. Okay. What Christ was saying by a camel going through the eye of a needle is that as difficult as it is for a camel to unload its sack of possessions, and squeeze through a narrow passageway, it's even more difficult for a rich man to unload or give his wealth to the poor and enter by the narrow gate, according to Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. But throughout this video, just notice how he avoids Matthew chapter 19, verse 22 which states that he, the rich young ruler, went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions, unquote. Again, Christ was literally commanding him to unload his great possessions. But Mr. Golden only gives a portion of this passage and one other scripture talking about the little children. So, so I'm going to teach you what it actually means. I think you're going to be blown away, and it's going to help eliminate some of the fear that people have, some of the fear that God's people have around making money. I don't think making money is the most important thing that you do in your life, but it's one of the most important things you do in your life. If you think about it, you spend probably more time in your, more time in your life as an adult working in exchange for money than any other th single thing you can do. Yeah, but work is spiritual. Making money is far more spiritual than practical, Mr. Golden. When Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God cursed the ground his sake and said he's going to have to work hard to eat of it all the days of his life. In the sweat of his face, he'll have to earn a living. Why? Because the good of the tree is both good and evil. Money can be used for good or evil. Let's be honest. It's mostly used for evil. But Adam, having to work for profit, came from evil because he was disobedient. Much like what you're doing, Mr. Golden. And so for somebody to think that making money is not important, they're delusional, right? And um, so I'm going to read the passage of Scripture to you. And... And, and a lot of people know this story as the story of the rich young ruler. But I believe that part of the reason people have a hard time interpreting it is because they think it's the story of the rich young ruler. It is not the story of the rich young ruler. Uh, yes, it is. That's why he's not mentioned by name. But emphasis is put on him being rich, young, and powerful. Uh, let me read it again. And um, behold, one came unto him and said, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, why callest thou me good? There's none good but one. How many are good? One. But in the man's question, how many were good? In the man's question, how many times did he use the word good? Two. He said, good master, you're good. What good thing shall I do? <laughs> see, see what happens when you read the Bible a little slower? 
He said, he said, good master, what good things shall I do? So Jesus said, there's none good but one. What's he saying? He's not saying, and that's God. He's not saying, well, I'm not God. Here's what he's saying. He said, either you're good or I'm good, but there's only one good. And if it's you, it ain't me. And if it's me, it ain't you. Okay, this is where he begins to spin the scriptures. I hope you are tracking, right? Um, for there's none good but one, and that's God. If thou, and if thou wilt either, um, but if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Before I go into that part, um, let, me, let me tell you why I say Jesus is God, and I know a lot of people want to argue with that, and that's fine. A lot of people just want to argue, like, and, 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 and a lot of people on YouTube want to argue, and that's fine. I don't have any desire to argue because the scripture says clearly, the servant of the Lord shall not strive, and so I'm not going to strive. I'm not going to argue with somebody. Um, but if I say, now, if you, if you disagree with me and you're on YouTube and you disagree with me, I, I celebrate your right to disagree with me. But if you're going to come on and all you're going to do is call names and spread negativity and you've got four subscribers on your channel, I'm going to delete your comment so you can go post it on your channel with your, to your four subscribers who care what you think. Okay? Now, if you, if you have a legitimate question or a legitimate disagreement, that is not an ad hominem fallacy, which basically you call somebody a name to disqualify their opinion, right? If it's not an ad hominem fallacy and you're not just being negative, then I'll happily answer your question if it's a question. But if you just want to come here on a platform that actually has subscribers because we're actually helping people and you want to spread your trash, we're going to delete your trash. We're going to take it out like the trash. And then you can go throw up on your own carpet in your own channel. Okay? So, so... So anyway, just want to, I'm just keeping it real. Just keeping it real. Like, that's how I deal with it. I, the first thing I do when I see a negative comment on my YouTube channel or on my Instagram, I go look and see how many followers you got, how many subscribers you got. And that's the problem. Satan has far more subscribers than Christ, which proves your message conveys contradictions. You claim Jesus is God, but preach a message that serves another God. And there are more who serve your God, Mammon, and hate the Most High. So don't rebuke them who serve the same God as you. Just choose which master you're going to serve. Yeah, and the reason everybody who leaves those kind of comments has none is because nobody wants to follow that yucky, nasty, disgusting feeling stuff, right? And, like, if you're trying to help people and I disagree with you, at least I can celebrate the fact that you're out there doing something to try to help people, right? Anyway. Anyway, that's my rant. I'm sticking with it. And so in case some of the people who, one, who left negative comments before are wondering why I deleted you, now you know. All right. So um, the reason I say Jesus is God, the scripture says in John chapter one, very, this very same book in chapter one, here's what it says. Uh, not, not, that was, this is Matthew. In John chapter one, here's what it says. It says in, in John chapter one, in the beginning was the word and the word was God. And the word was with God. So the word was both God Amen. and with God. And then it says, and the same was in the beginning with God. And then it says, all things were made by him. Him who? Him the word. And without him was not anything made that was made. So the word was God and the word was with God. And the word was with God from the beginning. And then later on it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Oh, so it sounds to me like Jesus is God. Um, in, in Isaiah it says, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a Son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he shall be called the Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father, Mighty God. Oh, okay. So even in the Old Testament and the New Testament, they both agree. In First John chapter 1, uh, verse number 7, I think it is, it says, There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. Okay. So, and by the way, just because you can't understand an infinite concept doesn't mean the infinite concept is not real, right? Uh, if, you say, if you say, well, that doesn't make sense to me, okay, the reason it doesn't make sense to you is for the exact same reason that you cannot put the Atlantic Ocean in a teaspoon. It doesn't fit. But it doesn't mean the ocean, it doesn't mean the water in the teaspoon and the water in the ocean are not both water. The, the spoon can't comprehend the ocean, but the ocean can comprehend the spoon. Can I get a witness? Now, on this point, he speaks truth. There is a mystery to the three bearing record in one. But man fails to comprehend this mystery. They try to make God like them. Okay, anyway. So, 
I don't know why y'all got me ranting this morning. <laughs> I'm going to blame it on you, even though I'm doing it because it's in me, right? Okay, so he said, why do you call me good? There's, not one, there's none good but God. So what is Jesus saying to this man? He's saying to this man, we cannot both be good. Either you're good or I'm good. Which is it? So don't come to me talking about good master, what good thing shall I do? Because if I'm the good master, there's no good thing that you can do, right? That's why the scripture says, for by grace are ye saved. By the, word, by the way, the word grace means gift. By grace are ye saved through faith. And that, that what? That faith is not even of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So God gives us the faith to receive the grace to trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the full payment for our sin and not add anything to it, not add our church attendance, our baptism, our good works, our tithing, or anything else to it, because that's what this passage is really about. No, it's not. A few years ago, I made a video titled The Four Pillars of Salvation. Faith, grace, works, and repentance. Faith is a practice of works accounted for through God's grace. James 2.18 says, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. James chapter 2, verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. How? Through obeisance to the Most High. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, present your body living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's about, I'm not going to tell you yet. It's about the children and the rich young ruler. Okay, let's go. So, and then, um, so he said unto him, why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, that is God. And now he's going to show him that he's not good, but the man's going to miss the point. But if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. Why did he tell him to keep the commandments? Is that how a person has, is that how a person receives salvation by keeping the commandments? No. Why is he telling the man to keep the commandments? Because the man already knows he can't do it. The man has already experienced the fact that he's already lied. He's already probably stole something. Like he's already done something he should not do. Right? So he said, here, go keep the commandments. He was giving the man the opportunity to say, I've tried that already and I can't. But the man, instead of confessing his weakness, he tried to show off his strength yet again. And here's what he said. He saith unto him, which? Which commandments am I supposed to keep? And Jesus named a bunch of them that he knew the man had kept. And then he named one he knew the man hadn't kept. I, I love the way Jesus teaches. It's so cool. It's like, it's like I'm going to give you enough rope to tie yourself up. Right? And here's what he said. He said, well, you know. Um, thou shalt do no murder. Don't kill anybody. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Don't, don't commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Like, like, if you want something, pay for it. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Don't be lying on folk. And the young man said, all these things have I kept from the, my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go sell that thou hast and give to the poor, that thou sh and thou shalt have tre uh, treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. Oh, honor thy father and thy mother. I, I left that one out. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's the one the man wasn't keeping. Love your neighbor like you love you. Right. Love your neighbor as yourself. You gather riches for the poor as you did for yourself. That's what it means. Jesus could look at the man, and if we were going to put it in our modern day vernacular, he could see that the man was dripping. Right? He had the best clothes. He had the best chariot. He had the best of servants, the best of sandals. He had the best of everything. Exactly. The same as the rich man who afflicted Lazarus. So why does God concern himself with their lavish lifestyle if it's about self-righteousness, Mr. Golden? Do you remember or do you recall that Abraham, in the vision of the rich man being in hell, lifting his eyes up in hell, 
it was Abraham, a wealthy man who was in the kingdom with the poor man, Lazarus. And Abraham was condemning the rich man. People tend to forget that. So he said, okay, honor your father and your mother. Okay, and by the way, love your neighbor like you love yourself. And then the man lies to him. And he's like, now he's getting, he's going from, he's going from self-deception to trying to go to savior deception, which can't work. Here's what he said. The young man said unto him, verse 20, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? All these things? Like he's saying, check, didn't kill anybody, check, didn't steal anything, check, didn't commit adultery, check, didn't bear false witness, check, honor my father and my mother, check. I love my neighbor like I love myself. Now Jesus is going to show him. He's already tried to tell him that didn't work. He's, now he's going to show him. This, by the way, understand when Jesus said to this man, um, uh, in verse number 21, and Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. That was not a universal principle. That was an individual prescription. <laughs> Is that right? That sounds like your opinion inspired by a seducing spirit. Again, Luke 6, 24 says, Woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. That sounds universal to me. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall weep later. Sounds universal to me. And it was an individual prescription, not even for healing the man, but for showing the man who he really was and that he was not who he said he was and he was not who he thought he was. All these things that I kept from my youth up. Really? You've kept all these from your youth up. You love your neighbor like you love yourself. Okay, let's put it to the test. You take really good care of you. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And let's see if you love the poor like you love yourself. So this is not, this is not, Jesus is not telling every rich person in the world, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. That's not what he's saying. Again, that's so far from the truth. Matthew 19, 29 says those, that's plural, universal. Those who forsake land, houses, and possessions for my name's sake shall inherit eternal life. What about Abraham? God blessed Abraham because he gave up his land twice and was willing to sacrifice his son. What Abraham inherited was not corrupted in any way, but more on that later. Even King Solomon, another one who did not desire to be rich, he was blessed by God. He even said himself, do not work hard to be rich. It was God who gave King Solomon those riches. He didn't ask for it. He's saying this man who is bold enough to lie to me to my face. I'm going to show you that you lied. Go sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. But when the young man heard the, that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus to his disciples, this is about to get good, y'all. We ain't even got to the good part yet. We're about to get juicy. Then said Jesus to his disciples, um, I lost my place because I'm moving around. Too, uh, verily, verily, or, or verily, truly, verily means truly, I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's the second time in this passage the kingdom of heaven is mentioned. What's the first time it's mentioned? Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. So you have to understand what the context of this story, the context of the story is the contrast in the character of the little children and the rich young ruler. That's the contrast. This whole story is about two totally different types of people. What are the two totally different types of people? Little children. What's unique about little children? Little children are totally and completely 100% dependent on someone other than themselves for their existence. Right. Little children are not puffed up to boast of how much wealth they have. Am I talking too fast? Maybe that's why the scripture says, except you have the faith of a little child. We are supposed to have childlike faith. Children are supposed to have adult-like faith. 
Why? Because children are dependent on somebody other than themselves for their existence. And we are dependent on somebody other than ourselves for salvation, whether we know it or not. Now, you can try to let your good works, like, appease God. Well, if I, when I die, if my good works outweigh my bad works, then maybe he'll let me in. I'm here to tell you, if your good works outweigh your bad works, that is not good enough. In fact, if you have 100,000 good works and one bad work, you miss the boat. Because sin is sin. And the scripture says, there shall in no wise, talking about the kingdom of heaven now, there shall no in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Neither whatsoever work of the abomination or maketh a lie. But they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. By the way, you can't write your name in the Lamb's book of life. Only the Lamb can write your name in the Lamb's book of life. And he also said he can block your name out the Lamb's book of life. So what are we saying here? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The once saved, always saved is published by the pits of hell, dude. Anyway. It says, Jesus said to his disciples, Verily, or truly I say unto you, shall a rich man, uh, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, understand this. That is talking about, that is talking about a literal camel and a literal needle. That is not some figurative analogy of whatever you want it to mean. It's not some gate in Jerusalem that's lower than the other gate. He is saying you would, it would be, you as a human would be able to thread a needle with a camel before you can enter into heaven as a rich man. So now what do we got to do? What, what, where are we stuck like chucking a pickup truck now? We got to find out what it means to be a rich man, don't we? Right? Because, see, here's the problem. People don't understand the key word to understanding that verse is the word rich. And the word rich is the word Greek word pluseos. By the way, don't take my word for anything I'm saying. Like, how's that, for, how's, that for, how's that for good teaching? Don't take my word. There's this thing called a Strong's Concordance. You can go look it up for your own self, right? Because why? Because the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? Because they searched the scriptures daily to see if the apostle Paul was telling them the truth or not. Well, if Paul, who wrote the 14 books of the Old Testament, I mean, of 14 of the 27 books in the New Testament, if they were checking up on him and it was a good thing, I promise you checking up on me or anybody else who fancies themselves a Bible teacher is probably a good idea. Can I get a witness up in here? That's the purpose of this video, to unpack the lies that you are telling. Okay. <laughs> so the key word in this verse is the word rich. And if you look up the word rich, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than it's for hardly shall a rich man, that word rich, in, the word, in verse 23, and that word rich in the verse 24 is the word pluseos. And what it means is figuratively rich. Now, guess where else that verse is? This is so good because the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. I love this stuff. So that verse is also found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8 and 9. For ye know the grace, that's a gift, of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, exact same word. How was Christ rich? He was rich in righteousness. Okay. That's why in Matthew 6, 19, he says, store up your treasures in heaven. How do we know that? <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, um, um, for he, that is God, hath made him, that is Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made what? The righteousness of God in him. So it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 8 and 9, it says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for his sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. So when Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven, he's not talking about a person who's rich in money. He's talking about a person who's rich in self-righteousness. Look, to fully digest what Christ said to the rich young ruler, we must adhere to Luke chapter 19, which gives an account of Zacchaeus, 
a wealthy tax collector who gave half his possessions to the poor and gave back fourfold what he took. Luke chapter 19 does not say Zacchaeus was self-righteous the same way it does not mention the rich young ruler is self-righteous. Although they may have been, it doesn't mention it. And Zacchaeus was obedient because Christ most likely instructed him to do so. Now, why would Christ ask them to do that? Okay, but again, remember six, uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 24. It's simple. Because they received their reward. But Christ is not just giving the rich a hard time. He's not just trying to make life difficult for them. Luke 6, 24 is only the surface level. Not only is this deed a godly principle according to Luke 12, 48, to whom much is given, much is required. The scriptures always deal with the root of the tree. Romans eleven sixteen says, if the root is holy, then so are the branches. Well, what if the root is unholy? <laughs> See, we have seen this before and still pay a grave penalty for Adam's sin 6,000 years ago. Even Christ had to die because of Adam's sin. So what unholy roots in the world have manifested to cause the Most High to be so harsh against the rich? Remember, Satan had the world to offer if Christ bowed down to him. Now, we know Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and he's the father of lies. We also know that Isaiah 14, 12 says, quote, he weakened the nations, unquote. To weaken the nations, you got to steal their resources, their infrastructure, their wealth, which is why Mark chapter 4, verse 19, Mark chapter 4, verse 19 says there's a deceitfulness of riches which chokes out the word of Yah. Who does the deceiving? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, says the God of this world, Satan, blinds the minds of unbelievers. Then 1 Timothy 6, 9, says, quote, those who even desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. And then to many foolish, harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction, unquote. James chapter 5, verse 2, takes it even further in connection to the unholy roots of the wealthy tree, which in today's world partakes from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, it says, quote, your riches are corrupted, unquote. And if you look at the contrast, if you look at the context of the whole story, you can see it. Now, as soon as I say that, you can see it clearly, right? Like, you're like, I never saw that before. But you, you can see it because Jesus said, if you will have enter into life, keep the commandments. Man says, which ones? And Jesus is showing you can't keep the commandments. In fact, the scripture says that the law was given to us as a plumb line to show us that we're crooked. Yes, you are crooked. Right. It was given to us as a standard to show us we don't meet the standard. Why? So we could realize how helpless we are and how hopeless we are unless one who fulfills righteousness takes our place. You know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, ever his sakes became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. He, that's God, have made him, that's Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not right to be equal with God. Let me give you a different verse. Let me give you verse 12. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name, which is above every name. That is the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So why did God give Jesus a name above every name? Because he, was, he had a position above all positions. What was that? He coexisted in eternity with God as God. Notice, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Who what? Being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, nor made himself of no reputation, okay? But he also was a person above all people. How's that? Well, made himself of no reputation, but took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likes of men. Even though he was God, he coexisted in eternity with God as God, he came to live on earth in time with man as a man. 
What? Correct. It's unfathomable to put God in a box like man. Time cannot contain the ancient of days. Time is a prison for us meat suits. It gets better. He had a purpose above all purposes. Who being in the form of God, thought not right to be equal with God, but made himself with no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God, and why did he die? He died to take your place. He died to take my place. He died because he who was perfect died for us who are sinners so that we, by believing in him, might have life. The scripture tells us over and over and over again, like church attendance is fine. Tithing is fine. Like uh, uh, being baptized is fine. Doing good works is fine. But that's not what saves anybody. In fact, if you're trying to use any of those things to save yourself, you are already lost. In fact, the Bible calls it twofold the child of hell. That's why it says in Matthew chapter 7, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, in your name we've done miracles. In your name we've cast out demons. In your name we've done mir- many wonderful works. And here's what he said. Then I will say to them, I'll, I'll declare unto them, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. What? I never knew you. Not, I, don't, I used to know you. I don't know you anymore. That's not the only type of souls he'll condemn. The scriptures reference a great falling away. Those who shall depart. From the faith, again, their names are to be blotted out. And what he said, I never knew you. Well, it's easier for a rich man to enter into the kingdom. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You would have a better chance. Here's what Jesus is saying now. Hear me now. It's in the, I'm not making this up. You go look up the words. It is easier for you to take a literal camel, like, you know, a camel, like, Mike, 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 Mike. Hey, Mike, what day is it, Mike? What day is it, Mike? Guess what day it is. <laughs> Hump day, right? It's, I'm talking about that kind of camel. It is easier for you to take a literal camel and put it through the eye of a needle your mama used to use to sew up your socks than it is for a person who's rich in self-righteousness to enter into the kingdom of God. I'll close by nullifying the lies this heretic versed. At this point, you can tell he is just a guy who is under the spell of this world system ran by Satan. So, 1 Timothy 6, 10 says, quote, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Remember that that, that word root in reference to the growth of a tree, rather it's holy or unholy, okay? So James 5, verse 2, again, universal, just says, your, quote, your riches are corrupted, unquote. Ezekiel 36 says, those who uphold Egypt shall fall, and the pride of her power shall come down. Now, Babylon, Sodom and Egypt are supposed to no longer be prominent. Why is it that all three are mentioned in Revelation chapter 11 and 18? Because it speaks about the nations who've taken on new names different from their description according to the scriptures. But you can change your name, but God just the deeds of your forefathers. The curse of Adam is consequentially, perpetually applicable to all men. Just as much as 1 Timothy 6 verse 9 and the aforementioned scriptures regarding the rich are also applicable to those who precede them and those who succeed them. Verse 9, those who desire to be rich. And verse 10, the root of all kinds of evil. So. This passage, in a nutshell, says even those who desire to be rich love money, which is the root of all evil. So how much more chronic and toxically hell-bound is a rich man's love for money? Abraham was wealthy. No, God redeemed Abraham for a special covenant of faith. 
and he changed his name and even changed his race from a Chaldean to a Hebrew because his forefathers were pagan. So the Most High redeemed Abraham through faith, making him the father of many nations. It just so happened that Abraham, to establish those nations, would need to have some type of wealth to establish them to fulfill the word of God, which is the promise that God was bringing them into the promised land. After the death of Moses, eventually the children of Israel, which is from Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, would receive that promise of God. God couldn't fulfill that promise without some type of resources that they will be given until they disobey God. You understand? So Abraham had a fresh bloodline. Originally, he was a Chaldean and he became a Hebrew. You see that? So the children of Israel, Abraham's descendants, were consecrated from the God of this world under the law of Moses. So the inheritance that God blessed Abraham with was not corrupted. Completely different from what you're saying, Mr. Golden. Which brings us to spiritual Sodom in Egypt. Reve Revelation describes Babylon as, quote, the mother of harlots, unquote. Verse 18, 17 says, In one hour, all their riches came to nothing. Why? Because the root of the tree in America, the landscape, infrastructure, its economy, the banks, Wall Street, the prison industrial complex, the military industrial complex, all of the, the slavery, okay, it was built off a corrupt tree, the transatlantic slave trade. Okay, no reparations were paid. And they continue to uphold Egypt, which violates Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 6. This system is supported by industries, corrupt industries. Okay, people make investments in the prison industrial complex. That's how the legal system is funded. You understand? Giving police officers planning drugs so that uh, men can be prisoned to sentence so the lawyers get paid, the judges get paid, etc. You see what I'm saying? That's just an example. Then they get more free labor through the prison industrial complex through the uniforms that the, the inmates wear. See how I'm breaking this down? This is why Christ he said their riches are corrupted. Okay, James chapter 5, verse 2. Okay, that, that through the military industrial complex, that's colonized wealth, wealthy resources throughout the nations. And they ripped these third world countries for their resources. Okay, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, etc. Okay, without those entities, Mr. Golden, you would not have been able to become wealthy. This is why the Christ in its infinite wisdom was foreseeing this as being a problem of root, rooted corruption from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You understand? So America sponsors those Again, Revelation chapter 2, verse 6, and 3, verse 6, speaks again to the corrupt wealth. It says the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not. In other words, their, their wealth stems from that lie, saying that they are Jews and are not. They receive great funding, the billions of dollars annually. You understand? Joel, Joel chapter 3 says, quote, they parted my land and scattered my people throughout the nations, unquote. So there must, there, there must be recompense. Your riches are corrupted. And again, Mr. Golden, you would not have your wealth if not for all those things that I just explained, which is a corrupt tree that supports the branches, which is the offshoot of the source of a wealthy, corrupt nation, the mother of harlots, America. So there you have it. 
There you have it. Go see First Peter chapter 1, verse 7 through 9, Mr. Golden. I don't have time to go through that. So think of it as one extreme to another. Sin is extreme and radical. That, 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 therefore, it takes a deep understanding in the scriptures to dig through this, to dig through what are the bill of sins, okay? What's the invoice of sin? You understand the penalty which God will recompense. Okay, why would God allow slavery? That's one extreme, right? The same way his beef against the rich may seem extreme to those who uphold Egypt. They're going to look at the judgment as too harsh, but are going to forget their wickedness, how, how they exploited third world countries. You understand how they don't pay the laborers their fair wages. The books have to be balanced. So, Mr. Golden, again, in your own words, you lying. Okay? You take real good care of you. <laughs> oh, man. They've constituted fraternal orders to consolidate power for themselves. You understand? All of these fraternities, they, they consolidate the wealth. Through serving another God. Okay. All of this equal opportunity employment. As a front. And all of this rhetoric. Such as quote. All men are created equal. Unquote. Okay. The founding fathers were deists. And Freemasons. They venerated Satan. Behind closed doors. So again. When these heretics. Like Myron Golden say these things, you just have to examine the scriptures to rightly divide the word of truth.